In the previous video, I introduced how calorimetry can be used um, to measure experimentally the enthalpy of a reaction. But before we can get into calorimetry, we need to discuss this thing called heat capacity. Okay, Heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of an object by one degree Celsius. Okay, and heat capacity um, is one of those few cases where uh, using units of Celsius are perfectly acceptable. Um, and that's mostly because we're going to be looking at differences in temperature. Um, and that's going to be the key here. But we definitely cannot use Fahrenheit as our units. So based on this definition, uh, we can say that the heat capacity for an object is going to be equal to the amount of heat that is required to cause that object to increase in temperature by some amount. Okay, so some change in temperature. Now we can rearrange this to calculate for heat. Okay, so heat is going to be equal to the heat capacity uh, times the change in temperature. Okay, so this equation is actually quite useful when you think about it. Um, if we know what the heat capacity is for a particular object, then we can predict how much heat is going to be required to raise its temperature by a certain number of degrees. But what's more useful to us right now in this setting is that if we know the heat capacity and we know the change in temperature, we can then figure out the amount of heat that had to have been transferred into that substance. Now, related to heat capacity is specific heat. Okay, and whereas heat capacity was a measure of the amount of heat required to raise an entire object by one degree Celsius, okay, specific heat is kind of uh, based upon different types of substances. Okay, so we say that the specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Okay, so what you can see here is the difference is now we're looking at differing amounts of the substance, whereas in the heat capacity we were talking about an object. Okay, we were talking about a frying pan. Okay, or we were talking about um, some particular block of some material. Um, in specific heat, we're talking about a particular type of substance based on the mass of that substance that is present. Okay, so uh, for example, we can look at how much heat it takes to heat up a steel fork, okay, versus the amount of heat it takes to heat up a steel barrel. Okay, you can see here there's a mass difference there, and as I'm sure you guys can imagine, the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a fork by one degree Celsius is going to be much less than the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a barrel by one degree Celsius. Okay, so specific heat okay, can be related to the amount of heat required to change the temperature by one degree is going to be equal to 
the mass times the specific heat okay, times the change in temperature. Okay, so you can see here that this factors in the amount of the substance, um, the properties of the substance itself through the specific heat, and then the change in temperature that's going to be um, induced by that addition or removal of heat. Okay, so these are both very, very useful um, uh, values that are going to help us in being able to pull information out of a calorimetry experiment. Okay. Okay, now the key to being able to perform a successful calorimetry experiment um, involves utilizing the first law of thermodynamics, um, which is that any heat that leaves a system is going to go to its surroundings, and any heat that leaves the surroundings must go to the system. So the idea in calorimetry is for us to carry out a process inside of a container, okay, and then to put that container inside of another container. Okay, and we call that region the surroundings. But I said earlier on that the system plus the surroundings equals the entire universe. So how can me putting a small container inside of another container uh, make my job any easier? Well, the key here is to make sure that this larger container is completely isolated from the rest of the universe, or at least as close as we can get it to be. And it turns out we can get pretty close. So if we were to wrap this in some kind of insulation, okay, basically what we're doing is we're creating our own little universe in which we can take measurements. Okay, so then the only heat transfer is going to be either from this container to the outer container or from the outer container to the inner container and that's it. Okay, so that greatly simplifies our measurements. Okay, but before we get too full of ourselves and start thinking that we created a universe, um, we use slightly different terminology uh, when we're talking about calorimetry. Okay, we have the reaction which is taking place inside that smaller container. Okay, and the larger container that this is taking place in is called the calorimeter. Okay, we'll just abbreviate that as CAL for now. Okay, so what this tells us is that since we know that inside this tiny little universe here that energy cannot be created or destroyed, well, we know that any heat that is changing hands from the reaction plus any heat that's changing hands from the calorimeter is going to have to be equal to zero. Okay, it has to balance out. So in other words, the heat of the reaction, I'm sorry, the heat produced by the reaction um, is going to be equal to the negative of the heat that is um, gained by the calorimeter. Okay, so in the course of every one of these calorimetry experiments, we are going to be numerically determining the amount of heat that is going to the calorimeter in order to calculate the amount of heat that has been released from the reaction. Okay, and then ultimately to find the enthalpy of the reaction what we need to do is to take the amount of heat that the reaction uh, produces and divide that by the number of moles okay, of the um, thing that's being produced or um, being um, consumed. Okay, so that's our goal here with a calorimetry experiment is to arrive at this enthalpy of reaction. Okay, by finding the amount of heat that the reaction releases or takes in 
as the negative of the amount of heat that the calorimeter releases or takes in. Now there are two different types of calorimetry experiment. Okay, we can have what's called a constant volume uh, calorimetry experiment or a constant pressure. Okay, so let's first consider a constant volume calorimeter. Okay, and we're going to try to make this as simple of a diagram as possible. Okay, so usually inside of a constant volume calorimeter we have a reaction taking place and that reaction is usually based on combustion. Okay, so what we have is we have a vessel, a vessel that we can open up, okay, where we can add a chemical to some container, maybe some kind of like a weigh boat type of thing, um, and then inside of that container is going to be a means of basically producing a small spark uh, that will cause um, the initiation of a reaction. Okay, and then in addition, we have a tube coming into this. And that tube is going to be routed to an oxygen tank. So basically we have this tiny container in which we are pumping in oxygen and whatever substance we're measuring and are able to produce a spark. I'm going to take this a little bit further away here because you'll see why in a sec. Okay, now this is where the reaction is taking place. Okay, for our purposes this is like our system. Now, surrounding this we have a larger container and that larger container is filled with water okay a known quantity of water okay and it is equipped with a temperature probe which is attached to some kind of a measuring device Okay, and once we have everything set up, once we have our sample inside the container, we pump in the oxygen, we hit the spark, okay, and that spark is going to cause a combustion to take place, okay, hopefully to completion. Now think about what's going to happen. As the combustion takes place, heat is going to leave the chamber, okay, and it's going to go to the water. Now, keep in mind that the way that this thing is created, there's little propellers in there that kind of uh, push the water around so that everything is evenly heated. Okay, and then also the outside of the, the calorimeter is going to be insulated. So all of the heat that is being dissipated is going to go into the water and to the components that make up the calorimeter. Okay, now here's how we, or here's the data that we're going to get. Okay, frankly there's actually one piece of data and that's going to be the change in the temperature of the calorimeter plus the water. Now because of all those um, all those various little uh, components that are present there and because of all the propellers that are pushing the water around and, and keeping everything evenly heated, um, the change in temperature for the calorimeter and the water should be about the same. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to treat the calorimeter, the calorimeter and the water all together as being one thing. Okay, so what we're going to know is the heat capacity of the calorimeter which would
would have to be given to you or you would have to be given data to calculate that. Okay, and we're going to know the change in temperature for the calorimeter. Okay, if we have that information, then we can figure out how much heat has been transferred to the calorimeter. Now, if we know the amount of heat that's transferred to the calorimeter, we just have to take the negative of that and that'll give us the amount of heat that must have been transferred from the reaction. Okay. Now, when that's all said and done, okay, we can then figure out just how much of this stuff we put inside of here. And we're going to know that in terms of mass. So we can go from the mass of the sample to the number of moles of the sample. And then our enthalpy is going to be equal to the amount of heat that the reaction has given off divided by the number of moles of the sample. Okay, and that's how we carry out a constant volume calorimeter, or calorimetry experiment. Now, a constant volume calorimeter uh, gets its name because the components that it's made of um, cannot change in volume. Okay, they're made of metal, they don't flex much, um, hopefully they don't change in volume or stretch. Um, so the volume stays the same, but clearly the pressure is not going to. Okay, so the pressure is going to increase inside of that, that sample vessel. Okay, and if you think about it, if we're not careful in how we construct this calorimeter, what we've really created is a bomb. Okay, that's why we call this a bomb calorimeter. Okay, so that's a constant volume calorimeter. Now let's take a look at a constant pressure calorimeter. Okay, in constant pressure calorimetry, uh, we have a container that can change volume. Okay, and typically these types of experiment, experiments are carried out in a very simple device like a coffee cup, one of those styrofoam coffee cups, because as it turns out these cups are fairly well insulated. And what we do is we add our reactants together in water. And again, we have a temperature probe, so we can measure the temperature of the water. Okay, and as the reaction is occurring, the temperature will either go up or go down. Now, if this cup is well insulated enough, that means that, or means that any heat that's released by the reaction Okay, is going to be equal to the negative of the heat gained by the water. So again, we have a situation where um, we know how much water is in the cup. Okay, so we know the mass of the water because we put it in there. We know the temperature change for the water because that's what we use the probe for. Okay, and we can look up the heat capacity, I'm sorry, the heat capacity, the, the specific heat of water. Okay, so the amount of heat that the water is going to gain is going to be equal to the mass of the water times its specific heat, which we can look up on a table, times the change in temperature of the water. So then, all we got to do is take the negative of that, 
to get the heat of the reaction. And if we know the number of moles of the reactants, then we can say that the enthalpy of the reaction, like before, is equal to the heat that the reaction produces okay, per mole of the reactants. Now the reason why we call this constant pressure is because if any heat is derived, or if anything tries to vaporize, it's going to be pushing out towards the atmosphere. Okay, and if we're pushing back towards the atmosphere, chances are we're not going to be affecting altitudes high enough that we'll be dealing with lower pressures. So the pressure will stay the same, but the volume can change. Okay, so these are two different types of calorimetry experiment that we can perform. In the next video, we'll look at these in a little bit more detail and see how we can break down the problems that are based on these questions.